<laughs> so since we're all sitting, can you take a picture? Of course. You're all sitting in the shade. <laughs> Smart one. Are you taking a picture of him taking a picture? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That was like Barack Obama that goes, Did you want to say I love watching people uh, watch me. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I do want to say something before. Friends, friends, we, need to, we need to be quiet over here because every time you laugh, uh, it goes inside. Oh. Oh, okay. Already told me. And that's what's going to happen. Okay. The nuns will. Come out with them. Just that acoustic over here is very bad. When you laugh, it's going to. <laughs> well, then you'll have to, to really listen up, okay? To, I, if I can't talk too loud. You, you can speak louder, but uh, when you laugh in this direction, it's kind of injuring the, the church. That's okay. Because... Who has the most trouble hearing? Just so that I'm, I know. No one's going to admit that, right? <laughs> you can speak up. Yeah, you can speak up. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so you've probably noticed... Uh, when we're doing these things, we're not going to just take a traditional approach, right? Um, so when we look at Matthew 5, it's actually <clears throat> an incredible affirmation of Hashem. I remember when I say Hashem, I'm just going to say that instead of Yahweh. Hashem choosing and electing Israel. Israel's election. And he's chosen the Jewish people. Now, who's been told before? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sermon on the Mount. It's a real great affirmation of Jewish election. None of us, right? It's not something we're taught. We're just taught this is a good sermon. It's a good Christian sermon. And then we, we kind of think about it in that way. Okay, so I want to, to first disarm a, a uh, modern uh, perception. Jesus, Yeshua came to start something new, okay? And the new thing was the church and the Gentile church, essentially. Um, a simple point is that the word ecclesia is used in the Septuagint at Exodus 20, okay? That the ecclesia, the congregation, the Septuagint is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament that predates Jesus, right? It was translated, the Old Testament was translated before Jesus, it was called the Septuagint. So 200, oh, I think it was even... It was more, started 250 years before, roughly 200. 250 years before Jesus came, the word ecclesia is used, and it means a gathering, a congregation, an assembly. Okay? Now, I need to tie together a few things here. So, when Paul is referring to the, the church, right? The word in our Bible is church. The Greek word is ekklesia. The word in, in Hebrew is essentially assembly, right? The gathering of people or the people. Oh, one little, one little comment. So most of the time in the New Testament, when it says ekklesia, they translate it as church. In Revelation, where it says the ekklesia of Satan, they translate it the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> so you can see the reversal. Yeah. <laughs> Because suddenly an interpretation has taken hold, right? And the Jew has become demonized. So the synagogue is demonized. Really bad, okay? <clears throat> but the gathering place was the synagogue. You see that in Acts 15. They say, hey, we're not going to put this big law on these Gentiles. Just let them keep these things. And if they want to learn more, have them go to the synagogues of Moses. Because Moses is taught in all these cities, okay? So I'm really going to 
tie together uh, four scriptures here, okay? Matthew 5, Deuteronomy 4. I'm gonna, we're going to just look at one verse in Psalm 119 and just those three. And I'll probably bring up another one that I'm not remembering yet. The point of Jesus' words here is going to culminate. So I'm going to kind of start at the end and then go backwards, okay, and work back through it. The culmination of Jesus' words are in verse 17. First point, though, who's Jesus speaking to on the Sermon on the Mount? His followers. The people, his followers, who are they? Jewish people. Jewish. Distinctly Jewish people. Right? You may have had a straggling Gentile. No one's coming up on the mountain to hear a rabbi, though, unless you're a Jewish person. Okay? And we know that why, because he, he says it distinctly later on at the end of Matthew 5. If you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a dichotomy. Right, the Gentiles are the pagans. Right, so who's so this is a a sermon that he is coming to his people, and they have an understanding of what he's saying. Okay, he's not bringing a new thing. Essentially, he's really just talking about Torah. Okay, and he's opening up the Torah. So when you get to verse seventeen, that's the the climax essentially of what he's saying. Do not think that I am coming to abolish the Torah or the prophets, the law and the prophets. Don't think I'm coming to do away with this. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And very simply, this was the beginning of the fulfillment was his death. The end of the fulfillment is the resurrection and the millennium, the restoration, right? Some people go, but see, he fulfilled the law, and now it's done away with. The law's done. And you go, no, no, no. <laughs> That's the exact opposite of the point he's making here, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill, because he follows with, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away. And this is the rhetorical thing, right? Heaven and earth is not going to pass away, right? Until my words are fulfilled. And he's just simply doing the same thing as Jeremiah uh, 31 through 33, he says, Unless the sun and moon fall out of the sky, my covenant with Israel remains. Right? So not the smallest letter or stroke will pass from the Torah until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls, well, I'm just going to leave it there, okay? I didn't come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke will pass from the Torah until all is fulfilled. <clears throat> and I don't want to give too much context, right? Not to insult everyone's intelligence here. To, to think that Jesus is his purpose is to show that the Word of God, right? We just call it the Word of God. The Word, the testimony, the statutes, the precepts, the judgments, as Psalm 119 calls them, the words, a lot of that gets summed up in just Torah, in law, okay? In Psalm 119, when you're meditating on it, what David is saying is remarkable because he says things like, my enemies pursue me hotly. I meditate on your precepts. And it's like, wait, hold on a second. He could overcome trials through meditation in the Torah, right? Because the precepts of the Father, the precepts, law, ordinances, judgments, statutes, words. But now I'm going to give you the holy crud. I may have never thought of that, okay? Who's he speaking to when he says, you are the salt of the earth? Remember, there's only one people up there on the mountain. Yeah. Okay, so this is where you may go, hold on. I'm not going to agree with you here, right? I want you to just to think, though. He's speaking to a people. He's speaking about the law and the prophets. Gentiles have no idea what those things are. 
he's saying to them, guys, and I, I really hear it as this plea, you're the salt of the earth. This is what I elected you for. I raised you up for this, right? And my covenant, as from Leviticus 2.13, that's one of the passages, that the sacrifice was seasoned with salt, but we, I can use the standard, the standard pastor's uh, reference that salt was a preserver and the Lord has preserved a people in the midst of all the nations that carries his what? His Torah and prophets. Okay? So he has preserved a people. You are the salt of the earth. He's essentially preserved his words in a people. But if the salt, and I, I just hear him pleading, if it loses, if it loses the point, right? If, it, if it's not preserving the words of Yahweh, it's not good for anything anymore, right? Except to be trampled. You are the light of the world. Okay? Why? Your word is a lamp. Psalm 119, 115. Your word, your Torah is a lamp to me. It is a light to my path. Why? It is guiding. So he says, guys, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. I put you in the midst of the nations on a hill to shine, to carry the words of Yahweh. And what was the point? To disciple the Gentile nations in this hope of restoration that goes from Adam all the way through the covenant. I didn't take this lamp and put it under a basket. So don't take the Torah, right? And what's he going to end here in a second? Unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees, right? Why? Because they didn't have the light of the Torah in them manifesting. That's what he said. You're an empty tomb, right? He's not speaking to all the people, right? Who, who does he indict from the beginning? Pharisees, the rulers of the law, those who will eventually crucify him. It's not all the people that he's indicting as is so often taught in our churches. I put, and I'm about to go to Deuteronomy 4 and, and make this point come home here, okay? A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. He's also speaking of the final restoration when Jerusalem is raised above all the mountains of the earth and all of the nations, Isaiah 2, right? Micah 4, stream to it and say, come, let us go up to the God of Jacob. Let us learn his Torah. <laughs> okay, so here we are going, oh my goodness, this is all tying back to five books, right? Let your light the torah i have given you shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven this is a direct repeat of deuteronomy 4. now i want to go there and show you <coughs> devarim just means uh words word it means words essentially it comes from the bar the word davar. So I'll talk about that another time because it'll be too much to do here. So listen to this. This is Moses speaking. Is this connecting with you guys' hearts? You seeing it? See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as Hashem, my God, commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you're entering to possess it. So keep and do them. Be, be like salt and be like light. Make yourselves carry this light. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Okay. So he says, you don't put up a light under a bowl. Why? Because it's supposed to give light to all who are around it. It's supposed to give light to the room. Therefore, I didn't take my people Israel and just set them off to the side. I set them in on the pinnacle of Jerusalem in the 
the, the epicenter of the earth and the heart of the nations to what? To shine with the truth of the statutes and judgments that God gave them. And that this would be in the sight of all the peoples. So they're supposed to see this light. And then what do they declare? Surely this nation is different than ours. That's the simple point. This nation is different than ours. Their God is different. They have understanding. They're a wise and an understanding people. Okay, so the initial jealousy was for Gentiles to see the light of the Torah. That God had chosen a people out of the 70 nations on the earth. He had elected a people that would have his words. This is the light of the Torah. Okay, so that's what David means in Psalm 119. This is the light that's shining. Isaiah 42 and 49 are going to go on to say, it kind of goes back and forth between Israel, my light, my chosen one, and Yeshua, the servant of the Lord, who's my light, my chosen one. And so Jesus is not coming to fulfill him, fulfill, embody this in himself to do away with it. Again, as we spoke of a couple of days ago, he is embodying this in himself to show he is the Torah. He wrote it. It's all a representation of him. Therefore, he has to fulfill every, every mark and every word because it's an extension of who he is. And he, therefore, he entrusted himself in the words. So what's John 1 saying? The, the word became flesh. The Torah became flesh is what he means. Okay? The Torah became flesh and then we looked and we beheld it. And we realized entangled in this was the mercy of God. We, we saw it grace and truth in the Torah that was a man in the flesh. So he's walking it out. So the last verse then. Any questions here so far? This is powerful, right? This changes the Sermon on the Mount. It really does. To say, oh my goodness, this wasn't just like the new Christian teaching of the day. The, <laughs> here's the new relevant message. <laughs> he's, he's confirming the story from the beginning. I made you the salt. I made you the light. What's happening? What's been happening these thousands of years? Right? I had to take you away to Babylon. I brought you back. It's still not happening. So what's the point? What's he longing after? So the way he starts then the sermon is to say this is the point. This was the point of the Torah. I want you to be a people who's poor in spirit. Who's mourning for the restoration promised from the seed of Eve. Who's gentle. Who's hungering and thirsting for the righteousness I've revealed in the Torah. Who's merciful, who's pure in heart, who's peacemaker. Who's willing to stand for these things unto persecution. Why? Because they are the original witness. They were carrying, the only people carrying the light of the Torah. You had one nation in all the nations of the earth that had a light. No other nation had a light that God had entrusted by His Torah and then reminded them of by the prophets. So to, He frames it then by saying, this, this is the point. This was the point of my Torah. That you would be meek. A meek people in the midst of the nations. <clears throat> but through the whole thing, he's not discounting it, right? So when you get to the end, you don't have to be mysterious here about the end of Matthew 5. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. He's just being very simple. <laughs> They're not meek. They're not humble. They're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. They have the appearance of these things, right? So it's amazing to see the Sermon on the Mount as an affirmation of Jewish election. The last verse is Romans 15. It's a verse that I quote a lot. And I go there because to me it's kind of the... It's a beautiful verse that's passed over a ton. Paul says, For I say that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcision. So Jesus' life 
was in servitude to the Jewish people on behalf of the truth of God. That's the Torah and the prophets. Okay, On behalf of the truth of God, what's been revealed, the Torah and the prophets, to confirm the promises given to the fathers. Okay, So he didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And his life and death is then what? A confirmation of the promises given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so Paul, and then he says, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy, right? It's kind of like Ephesians 2. You, you didn't know about any of this, but you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. You didn't really know about the truth of God and everything it was, but you should glorify God for his mercy because you're welcome into this. Sometimes I say we Gentiles are a footnote in the story. That is going to kind of terminate and reach this incredible climax at the end of the age where our calling to serve the Jewish people in the midst of Jacob's trouble really can take front and center stage mm -hmm. if there's a Gentile humility in a movement that, with understanding. It's a movement of understanding. And this is why Rick and I really were taking these opportunities to just talk about these things. A.K.A. Joel. Sorry. <laughs> Joel, Joel's his fake name. <laughs> We're taking these opportunities to not just be here, right? You're here in the land. And we're, we're wanting to open these things and say, and not saying, oh, you didn't have understanding. That's not what we're saying. Just that to take away from here an outcome that plays out in your lives, right? He was just talking about discipleship. Right? It's not just discipleship to being a better Christian. This isn't a be a better Christian trip, right? It's a go away with understanding to live as a disciple in this gospel. So... Father, I just, your, your word is, is so complete in a sense of, of, of depth and richness, God. And, and I pray that we would be able to unlearn the things that hinder us from seeing truth. That you could take them away and uproot the weeds that are spoiling the garden and catch the foxes that have stolen away the truth of the Torah and the prophets. And God, that you would restore an understanding of these things. That our, our entrance, our unity with you as the, the Messiah of Israel joins us to this people by faith. And your law, your Torah, and your prophets, or Nevi, are our scriptures. Restore the, the, the love of Psalm 119. Give us the same love that David had in those passages. We love you, Yeshua. We thank you for your mercy. We glorify God for this mercy shown to us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.